Ross Clark is my guest here today. I've just um, published a book called Not Zero, How an Irrational Target Will Help Impoverish You, Help China and Won't Even Save the Planet, which is um, an, an analytical takedown, if you like, the case against the UK government's um, target to reach net zero by 2050, Britain being one of 17 countries around the world which have um, uh, committed themselves to eliminating net carbon emissions um, by 2050 or by another date. Um, it was passed through the British Parliament in 2019 without even a vote. Um, this one of the most far-reaching uh, pieces of legislation you could imagine, um, without even a vote, without any, the government having any idea what it would cost or even how it would achieve it. So a lot of the technologies have been needed to achieve it haven't even been invented or at least um, upscaled into commercial forms. So um, it seems a bit of a hostage to fortune, you might say. Uh, how did it get pushed through with no vote? How did, how did that work? Um, well, this was in the dying days of Theresa May's government when um, a lot of people's minds were on Brexit. And um, it was passed through as a if you like, a, a sort of extra clause on an existing piece of legislation called the Climate Change Act, which was um, passed in 2008. Well, that committed Britain to an 80% reduction in carbon emissions by 2050. And the, the, the extra clause, the extra bit of legislation, that sort of went the whole way down to a 100% drop in carbon emissions. But that's a very serious um, change. It might not sound a lot to some people, but that is a very, very serious change. So can it be thrown out without a vote too then? It couldn't be thrown out without a vote. No, the um, if if it, you know, in future it, it has to be revised, and I think it will have to be revised at some point. Um, it will require a piece of primary legislation through the British House of Commons, and um, at the moment it would be a rather unlikely vote to, to win, but um, still the, it's, the majority of MPs seem to be married to the idea that we can eliminate carbon emissions um, by 2050 without any serious effect on the economy, or even they think it'll make us richer, we'll make it cheaper for everybody. Well, it's not exactly... Um, turning out that way at the moment, where people are being sort of threatened with bills of tens of thousands of pounds for insulating their houses, replacing their gas boilers with heat pumps, and so on. And it's um, you know, that the costs are sort of gradually, I think, dawning on the British public. And you've really been down into the details of like heat pumps, for example, where they, whether they make sense or whether people who have a boiler that's working, whether it makes sense for them to spend the money on a heat pump. It doesn't make sense, does it, for most people? It, well, it, it doesn't. I've gone down to the nitty gritty of um, home heating and, and every other issue as well. But uh, on heat pumps, um, I mean, you can buy a, a new gas boiler and install it in Britain for about £2,000 at the moment. To install a heat pump will cost you ten thousand pound, but it won't even necessarily heat your house. <laughs> That's the thing. I mean, a lot of people who are sort of a friend down the road has just had one installed, and the guy installing it was uh, said um, told him, "Well, it'll it'll sort out about ninety percent of your heating needs." Well, I was going to going to spend ten thousand pound on a new heating system. I'd rather expect it to do the whole heating. <laughs> Not just um, yeah. heat when it's sort of mild weather. And of course, the things don't work so well, um, particularly air source heat pumps. They don't work so well when it's cold. Well, that's when you need the heating, isn't it? I mean, you don't particularly yeah. need to warm your house up when it's 20 degrees outside. So, yeah, if they really did work so well, then they wouldn't need to force you or, or uh, subsidize you to do it, right? People would just do it if it made so much financial sense to do it. Well, well exactly, yes. Yeah. I mean, the... <laughs> The, the things which sort of do capture the public imagination, but it's because, um, you know, they make financial sense and um, heat pumps don't yet make financial sense, or at least not in Britain, and nor, nor do electric cars, the other great bugbear in this country. I mean, it's, it's gradually dawning on the government that um, electric cars are not going to sell themselves. They, they, they're too, they cost too much. Their range is too restricted the um difficulties of recharging them 
and the life of the batteries, they're all um, technological problems that haven't properly been overcome. And yet, um, you know, in just um, seven years' time, we've been told we will not be able to buy a petrol or diesel car in Britain. What happens oh, so, then? I don't know. So that is the, the current plan in 2030? No more um, internal combustion, yes, it's new to cars? to ban yeah. um, petrol and diesel cars from 2020, uh, from 2030, sorry, and to ban hybrids from 2035. So um, after that, no petrol or diesel at all. Although in the, the EU, the European Union, which we tend to think of being um, – uh, you know, having lots of um, mad um, regulations and rules, um, they've actually just sort of relaxed it a bit. They were going to have this 2035 deadline as well, where they've said, well, we perhaps will um, have internal combustion engines after that date, but we'll maybe run them on biofuel or e-fuels. So uh, how close to 2030 do you think uh, the UK will get before they relax their rules and uh, say, just kidding, we're not going to do it by 2030? I, I think it will come sooner rather than later because um, you know, no car manufacturer is going to make cars just for the British market. Um, so, you know, if it becomes commonplace across Europe that, um, you know, the internal combustion engine remains a standard product in other countries, well, you know we're going to be we're going to have to accept um, them on British roads too. I mean, you know, Britain's a quite a small country. We, um, you know, we we can't just shut out all foreign vehicles. We rely on their lorries from coming over from Europe for a lot of our food supplies. So I mean, we're not going to we're not going to force um, them off the road. I don't even know what is the electric car, a pure EV penetration in Britain right now. Do you think? In yeah. February, it was um, 16% of the market for new cars was electric vehicles. But that's actually down from February 22 when it was 17%. So, uh, you know, the, basically electric vehicle sales in, in Britain have stalled. They're, um, you know, they're, there's a lot of wealthy people who can afford a electric car to show off or um, people live in cities if you live in a city and you drive short distances it makes perfect sense but um as a second car i think but you know, electric cars aren't really getting beyond that market they're, they're sort of stuck at the moment yeah they're not being used much are they for people that live maybe in the country and they have only one car and that only one car is an ev it doesn't seem like that's uh common no it's it's not Practical. I mean, a lot of these um, electric cars would only do sort of 150, 200 miles um, maximum on a single charge, even on a good day. Um, well, if you need to drive three or 400 miles in, in a day, and I need to do that on a number of occasions a year, well, it, it gets pretty miserable <laughs> if they've got to. Uh, and the chargers just aren't there. I mean, the. Um, you know, I plotted a journey up to Scotland. It would have taken me seven stops oh, yeah. on the way, seven charges and an hour each time. And you just think this is completely ridiculous. People aren't actually doing that, right? When do you even uh, plan it out? Do you think, I'm not doing this? <laughs> I don't, there's very few people making long journeys by electric car. I think they're um, using them around town, local journeys, commuting. But if they want to go anywhere further afield they they have a they have a second yeah. petrol car as well you have some good stuff i'm going to read here about uh using battery technology on planes it says battery technology will no doubt improve but at present we are a couple of orders of magnitude away from having battery powered planes that could be as light as a fully fueled jet airliner Do you have anything to add to that uh, maybe a very tiny planes some small planes could be battery powered over here in scotland for example we have a lot of islands and there are some um short hop um, airline is going on. There's one journey is famously only 45 seconds. It just goes up <laughs> one. Uh, that, you can do that by electric plane. Yeah, that, that would do. But to cross the Atlantic, I mean, I, I calculated that a Boeing 777, um, to have the batteries to deliver the power to get there, would have to weigh the same as the Eiffel Tower. But then, of course, it wouldn't take off. So, <laughs> I mean, it's just physically impossible under current technology to, um, you know, engineer a battery-powered play plane that will take an airliner over the Atlantic in the way we currently do. And you mentioned another important point, that the jet-fueled plane gets lighter as it burns fuel, and then uh, that makes it easier to land. But the battery-powered plane still weighs the same at the end. 
<laughs> yes, unless, unless you're going to throw your batteries overboard on the way. <laughs> it's still going to weigh the same when you land as when you um, take off. And that's a problem because, I mean, um, jet planes rely on getting lighter as they go along so they can actually land. And if you take off and you need to land quickly, yeah, they have to dump fuel. So um, it's another big, you know, we, we just do not have the technology at present to... Um, replicate jet airliner flight by um zero carbon means the, the, the i think the most likely outcome the most likely solution would be um e-fuels where you synthetic fuels who actually make um jet fuel from hydrogen and carbon um by other means using a lot of energy but you know the problem is the the fuel would cost about five times as much as um current jet fuel currently does so it's a uh, Quite a severe um, cost penalty. So, do you think the biggest problem in that this stuff is politically uh, popular just because people don't understand at all that they just think the magically technology will allow us to have a, a battery powered jet and things like that? Yeah, well, that's exactly it. I mean, the MPs and so on, we have very few MPs in Britain who have a sort of scientific technological background. A lot of them are sort of degrees in ancient history or politics, philosophy, and economics. And so they don't sort of have an idea of um, engineering nor uh, any sort of real idea what it will um, um, cost. And and they just get sort of hoodwinked by, um, uh, you know, lobbyists who sort of want to, uh, la- you know, public grants or something to push their green solutions, green technology, and, and sort of... Um, you know, no, nobody, none of our lawmakers have really thought through it properly. But uh, you are one of the people who's pushing energy realism in the mainstream in Britain, wouldn't you say? I don't know if there's more of you or. Are yeah, you kind of yeah. Well, I, I'm certainly trying to do it. There are a few others of us as well. I think we are, you know, making maybe a little bit of headway now, but um, it, it, there's still no sign of um, this net zero target being relaxed in any way. It's sort of. At the moment, we just seem doomed to drift to a sort of a declining economy. And this, this is the really harmful thing, which, um, you, you know, you might, a lot of people might not be aware of, but um, the net zero target um, refer, in Britain refers only to what are called territorial emissions, which are um, carbon emissions physically spewed out within Britain. It doesn't include, for example, carbon emissions um, created in the cause of making um, manufactured goods or food for the British market produced elsewhere in the world. And so w- what we have is government has given itself this incredibly perverse incentive to close down our remaining industry, um, close down our agriculture, um, so we can export the carbon emissions with those industries. And um, I-, I mean, it's completely ridiculous to do that i mean it's it's not just in britain as well the netherlands they're um uh, you know the the governments have issued an order to try to shrink its agricultural sector it's very hugely ex- <laughs> successful farming sector now government wants to close it down to you know meet pollution targets you had another good example of uh closing down natural gas production in the uk and instead having the gas produced maybe in the us or someplace and then uh, made into lng and shipped over and then burning it anyway so it ends up in the losses and uh having to run it through the lng process you end up with more co2 emissions than if you just did it the original way right yeah yeah well 10 years ago britain had a serious chance of creating a shale gas fracking industry you know which has been so successful in the in the states that promoting energy security and reducing carbon emissions since replaced coal in a lot of cases um but you know there's a lot of protests there's a lot of false information claiming that it was going to cause earthquakes and um pollute groundwater and so on it didn't happen it's just been kicked into the long grass as a result, you know, when um, Putin invaded um, Ukraine last year, we we then wanted to uh, boycott Russian gas and we weren't producing it ourselves or we're not producing enough ourselves. Um, so that, you know, the folly of um, passing up the chance of a shale gas industry, um, you know, became apparent. But um, the result of it is that we are importing large quantities of um liquefied natural gas from the US and from Qatar 
but that's very expensive to do not just in cost but in terms of energy you know you you lose about 10 percent of the gas by compressing it and decompressing it and so on so you know we're actually you know responsible for more carbon emissions than we would if we had our own native gas um, industry which is just stupid really so how about politically are there people that stand up uh, politicians and uh, you know use some actual data and point out the flaws with this uh, going green plan well there there are a few you know it's slightly gathering there's a what is called they call themselves the net zero scrutiny group of a small number of mps in the conservative party um which is in government but um, i say at the moment they're not sort of um winning the argument they're not uh, numerous enough the, the government's still officially trying to uh um, maintain this sort of impractical target. You have interesting quotes here from your book as well about Boris Johnson in September 2020. He spoke of Britain becoming, quote, the Saudi Arabia of wind. But in 2013, he said wind turbines couldn't pull the skin off a rice pudding. So what happened to him in seven years? <laughs> when... well, talk about the zeal of the converted. I mean, he was always <laughs> a skeptic. I mean, I, I know Boris's positions on this because, I mean, I used to be his leader writer when he edited the Spectator magazine. So I used to write his views on um, <laughs> climate change and um you know, he was always a great skeptic. He wouldn't sort of accept anything. And then um, suddenly, you know, this road to Damascus um, conversion, he suddenly wants to cover the country with wind turbines. But, I mean, you know, being Boris, he hasn't really done the research and um, doesn't really sort of understand what he was sort of trying to promote. He said he wanted... Uh, uh, you know the the country entirely to be powered by wind the entire electricity well you can't do that because the wind doesn't blow all the time well i think that seems to be sort of um rather the the lost on him and i mean the situation with electricity in britain we're, we're heading towards this very large cliff edge because at the moment about 40 percent of our electricity is generated by gas about 25 percent is um generated by wind and solar and um the gas you know balances the wind and solar so when the wind's not blowing the sun's not shining we turn up the gas and when the sun's shining and the wind's blowing we turn down the gas and that sort of works it's not necessarily the most cheapest way of generating um energy because you've got all these gas plants sitting idle for a lot of the time but it does work it keeps the lights on but by 2035 um you know the the government's plan is to remove all gas from the the national grid as well well you know what happens then when you know the wind's not blowing the sun's not shining i i have never heard the government explain to me i've asked ministers i have um, challenged them many a time but they just cannot do it they just cannot tell me what is going to happen they just keep saying well we could you know use battery storage or we could um you know to have produce hydrogen when the um energy uh, you know we've got surplus energy and then burn it when we've got a lack of energy but you know th those for you know that form of energy storage they're, they're very very expensive you know to generate a, a kilowatt hour of um electricity from a wind turbine costs about fifty dollars um to store that unit of um uh, energy uh, you know in a battery will cost you about three hundred dollars <laughs> i mean that's uh you, you know you're gonna pay about six or seven times as much for your energy if you um if you've got to store it by by battery so it, it, you know it's I incredible cliff edge that we're we're heading for so in reading your, your book and talking to you, it seems like the politicians in Britain kind of sincerely believe in the fairy tale of running things on wind and solar, but it's a contrast to in China. It sounds like they don't. They realize that they're going to need hydrocarbons to keep things running and they're they're not all as worked up about carbon emissions. Do I have that right? Well, I mean, yeah. China is the world's biggest investor in wind and solar power. I mean, it's not that it's sort of passing up on renewables, but um it's also the biggest investor in new coal plants i mean china is very energy hungry it's sort of expanding economy it's taking a lot of manufacturing industry from europe and um it wants energy from all um directions it can it will certainly go for 
clean energy where that's effective, but it's not going to throw put all its eggs in one basket as um, we seem to be trying to do here. I did have something here. Uh, you wrote in your book, China's Five-Year Plan, uh, had a section on flood defenses, and that does not even mention the climate, which would be sure to dominate such a document in the West. So it seems like uh, at least they are not buying into the whole thing, idea of hydrocarbon fuels cause flooding, at least over there. Is it? No, no. Yeah. Well, um, China has long suffered from flooding. It's got very long rivers, very wide, shallow valleys, and flooding is a way of life in many parts of the country. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, the co- government obviously wants to tackle that. Well, flood defences manage the rivers better, but they don't think they can eradicate floods by um, reducing carbon emissions. <laughs> so, you know, they want engineering. So, Is it the Grenfell Tower fire where people may yeah. have died because of the climate cultism where they, they had they had an original plan that would have eliminated fires fairly well, but then they went back in and put Yeah, in, yeah. yeah. yeah the, the Grenfell Tower was um, a tower block in West London, um, which um, you know had very very serious fire was burnt out in um, June 2017. Um, Seventy pe- two people were killed there, partly because the sort of bungling of the, the the escape plan wasn't there. Um, but that that was a I mean it's one of these blocks that's built with a single staircase. There's only one way out, one way in. Um, was about twenty stories or something. And uh, when it was built, it was built as a concrete shell outside and inside and of very, very strong rules that said, you know, that the safety of the building was dependent on not having any combustible surfaces inside or outside. So we can make this a non-combustible building, then we can get away with having this one single staircase. Um, But what happened in 2016, just before the fire, um, is that the building was clad in insulation material, which proved to be flammable, and um, insulation and cladding, which w- w- was very flammable. And um, when one of the fires, uh, it was, the fire began with a fridge in one of the flats, it spread to the outside of the building, and just the whole of the building just went up in flames very, very quickly, uh, and people weren't able to get out. And... Um, I mean, the reason why th- these buildings are being clad in um, this material was to insulate them. It was sort of part of a, you know, plan to cut carbon emissions and improve the comfort of the people who live in the buildings. Um, but you know, sadly, fl- fire safety just went out of the window. I mean, it's not that you can't insulate buildings safely, but um, you know. When the climate, when reducing carbon emissions becomes the be all and end all of everything, you know, bad decisions are made, and um, you know, they they were appalling decisions were were made on that occasion. Do you think there are more uh, towers like that that might still go up? I mean, there's some talk about building new towers using wooden timbers. We've had um, a terrible problem in the past year, and uh, past um, six years, anybody who lived in a tower block. Um, you know, they've they've had to pay a fortune to have their tower surveyed to check it's not being insulated with flammable material. Um, it's cost a huge amount of money. People, you know, losing their life savings over this. You know, and I think you know headway is being made in in making some of these buildings safe. But you know, at the same time, um, you know, I found this. Um, occasion when a housing minister uh, from the UK government went to see this new tower block is so it was all built in wood you know that's a you know <laughs> it's great for the environment he said well you know we've just been trying to remove this dangerous cladding and yet you know we then go to say oh we'll build all tower blocks in wood in future I mean it's just completely ridiculous and um how the uh climate um is being allowed to sort of wag the tail of the dog. And uh, haven't there been other fiascos about over-insulating buildings so that they get uh, mold uh, and they get too uh, wet in there? I think you wrote about that, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, the problem is, I mean, it is perfectly possible to insulate buildings well um, and not have problems and as long as you ventilate. If you're going to um, insulate a building, 
um, well, you, you've got to ventilate it properly because otherwise, you know, in summer the sun will shine through the windows and you'll get a mini greenhouse effect. The heat will just build up inside. You've got to get that heat out and you've got to pump it out through a proper ventilation system. But, you know, what we've been doing in Britain with far too many buildings is that um, we just fit the insulation without the ventilation. And um, it, it's creating, you know, these sort of sick buildings where, um, you know, people getting far, far too hot. And of course, then when they get hot and suffer heat stroke, it's all blamed on climate change. When it's it's like saying, oh, dear, we're going to have more of these hot nights and people won't be able to cool down. Well, I say, you know, it would hope if we sort of actually properly ventilated our buildings. Uh, do you think uh, a lot of this green stuff is being pushed on Britons from people outside of the country or where do you think the major push is coming from? Well, it's a mixture of both. I mean, there's sort of a lot of lobbyists um uh, you know, who stand to make a lot of money from um, efforts to tackle carbon emissions. If you're, you know, your business is making um, wind turbines or solar panels, for example, there's a whole, you know, thousands of jobs now in the uh, public sector, government jobs in Britain, which are just sort of something to do with climate change, you know, net zero scrutiny officer or something. And, and you know, there's a whole sort of... Um, salaried sort of group of people who who have a vested interest in in pushing through this agenda now and um you know once you've got that in place it's sort of very very difficult to um get away from it because you've got so many people in government who are trying to push it yeah. if you ask people do you want to tackle climate change they say yes because it's you know it's a virtuous thing to do and of course they may also have um, fallen victim to a lot of sort of hysteria um, you know, I'm, I'm quite happily accept that the Earth is warming and we should do something about that. But, you know, some of the claims made about extreme weather are just, you know, completely over the top false. Uh, but, you know, sadly, a lot of people have fallen for them. Um, so, you know, generally, support, generally speaking, there's some um, generalized support for um, tackling climate change and the net zero target. However, once you start getting into the nitty gritty of what it means for people personally, like fitting 10,000 pound heat pumps or changing your car to a much more expensive um, electric vehicle, then support dies away really very quickly. And sort of, we, we, you know, we're just getting to that stage now where it's sort of realization, people coming to understand how much it's going to cost. And I think that sort of public opinion is changing somewhat now. Part of the government's plan is to um, install 600,000 heat pumps in British homes every year between now and 2035. Um, well, how far have they got? Well, last year, 55,000 were done. So they're not even a tenth of the way to you know the target that they, they say we must do every year. So, you know, already the government's falling so hopelessly behind its um, schedule for net zero. Okay. And then they were doing that uh, by uh, using big subsidies per heat pump, right? I don't know if they have enough money to keep doing that. Or... Well, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, even people are being offered um, £5,000 each to uh, install a heat pump, which sort of brings down the cost from 10000 to 5000 But But even so, <laughs> people aren't taking up the bait. And part, part of the reason is because, you know, there's so many... Um, anecdotal stories of people who have had trouble with fitted them and they don't keep their house warm. And there's a lot of mixed stories. There's some people who say, you know, that it's worked very well in their house, but others who haven't. But the trouble is when you set up one of these um, schemes, like to fit um, heat pumps in 600,000 homes, I mean, we don't have the skills to do that. And what happens is you just get a load of cowboys come into the market and, um, you know, don't know how to do the job properly and um, take a lot of money, to swallow the public subsidy and, um, you know, leave those poor homeowners with um, inadequate heating systems. How much is that rooftop solar panels for individual houses in uh, in the UK? Is that happening a lot? Um, there's a lot of houses have them. I, I've got them on my roof. As, uh, as they, they work very well. They, they generate... Um, Four kilowatts when the sun's shining as it is today, um, and um, but it makes financial sense to me because um, part of the deal when I 
took them out was that I would be paid about 60 pence per kilowatt hour for generating electricity. Well, you know, at the time, electricity cost 15 pence per kilowatt hour. Wow. So, really? you know, there's a huge subsidy going on there, which um, which works for me. But, um, um, you know, I think the cost of these panels has come down. You know, they, they might make sense in conjunction with some batteries. But, of course, you know, solar panel is a brilliant way of generating electricity when you don't really need it all that much right. because the, it's a warm, sunny day and you don't need the heating on I'm curious, did they guarantee you some sort of flat rate that's good for 20 years or something, or does it float every year? Yeah, there's tw 25 years rising with inflation. Um, so oh. it made it, I mean, it cost me £11,000, I think, to install the um, the, uh, the the panels where they've already earned, I think, something like £20,000 in income. So um, they're, they're doing their job. <laughs> Uh, what is the deal if you need to uh, replace the roof on your house? You have to take off the panels and replace the roof and put them back on, something like that? Or um, I If know. I had to replace the roof, I would take them off and replace the roof and put them back. But I'm, I'm not planning to re <laughs> replace the roof, so no, right. no problem at the moment. And is snow any problem where you are, or it does? does hey, snow it occasionally yeah. snows, okay. not not a lot. Not is not like it does in the background <laughs> to your yeah. um, thing, but um. When it snows, obviously you don't get much um, energy generated, but you, you don't get much um, solar energy in Britain in winter anyway. So, um, okay, but, you know, from this time of year to from now until September, I mean, they will generate a, a lot of electricity. Do you have uh, other points you'd like to make? Well, I, I said the um, the hysteria over extreme weather. I mean, this is a really big thing in Britain. Is a lot of people now believe because they've been told numerous times for example that britain is becoming stormier that we're suffering bigger and worse storms well that is absolutely the opposite of the truth britain is becoming less stormy that's what the observational data tells us that the extreme wind speeds well there's a downward trend for the past you know 40 years we're told you know we're going to suffer more and more floods and more and more heat waves well, floods maybe, maybe, but um, the trouble is in Britain, we, we have this very mean, tight-fisted attitude towards flood defence. And, um, you know, at one time we, we were spending five times as much subsidising wind farms as we were on building and maintaining flood defences over the whole of Britain. And um, on the east coast, we've got a lot of soft cliffs, soft cliffs, clay sandy cliffs they erode very very quickly and they've been eroding for the last ten thousand years we could easily stop that by um building um concrete sea walls where they're eroding um or recharging the beach as doing the dutch do which is to suck sand a couple of miles offshore and pump it on the beach build the level of the beach up well, we're just not doing that sort of thing i mean if the dutch took their the same attitude. I mean, they'd have to abandon water of their country because it already lies below sea level. Whereas in Britain, we seem to just sit by and, and do nothing. Um, so, so in the UK, I, when people, um, if there's a cold snap, they blame global warming for that. And if it's too hot, global warming, uh, floods and droughts, people are buying all that pretty much. Yeah, ev everything's to yeah. do with climate change. Is it? That's good. <laughs> Um, and it's true, we had a very severe heat wave for a couple of days last um, summer, and heat waves do kill people, especially when they're not used to the heat. But um, balanced against that, of course, I mean, we're, we're suffering fewer cold extremes in, in Britain uh, as te global temperatures is warm a bit. Well, I mean, the cold kills far more people than the heat does. So, I mean, to date, I and mean, this is true in Britain, it's true around the world, um, the, there's been a reduction in deaths from extreme heat, and yet we keep being told the opposite. And I remember your 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 climate envoy John Kerry came over to do a a speech in London last December. I went along to listen. He said ten million people a year are dying of extreme heat, and I went away and looked. I was where's he got that from? And I found this study uh, done by the um, Monash University in Australia, and they analysed deaths from all around the world and came to the conclusion, well, 5 million extreme deaths from extreme health. And John Kerry doubled it for some reason. But, um, but of those 5 million deaths, um, 
nine tenths of them were deaths from extreme cold and only 10 percent from extreme hot. and that was true even in africa so i mean you know to date you know the deaths from extreme temperatures there's a downward trend and yet for some reason you know the message has got through to a lot of people that you know <laughs> that climate change is killing millions of people a year it, it's completely ridiculous and um, needs to be called out do you keep in touch with any skeptics over there like uh, delling pole or uh, chris morrison or do you uh, read skeptic blogs or, or robert bryce any uh, any people that yeah, I, know? I, I i i know james and I, I know a lot of people who are involved in in this kind of thing matt ridley as well so they all have their own um own own views on it i mean i don't think they agree with James selling poll on, on on much of this but I, I come at it more from a sort of engineering point of view but um yeah I'd say there are some peripheral voices who are very skeptical about um net zero but um at, at the moment we, we are still sort of fairly small in number did you ever believe in the wind and solar thing that uh that we could run all of you the UK on wind and solar power or were you skeptical from the start when you heard about this well, I think it's, it's a bit far-fetched. Um, I mean, at the moment, wind and solar. I mean, wind and solar has been a huge increase in the in the past um, few years. So they now um, account for nearly a quarter of the electricity used in Britain. And a lot of people get mixed up between electricity and energy. So it might be a quarter of the electricity we use, but it's only three point two percent of our total energy needs. Um, so that you know, that's a huge, huge gap that you you would have to sort of fill if you're you're going to um, uh, you know get to a sort of wholly renewable sources of energy and um, and you know this, the the energy storage issue is the the one that's going to really sort of kill it kill it off. Uh, how about nuclear power in the UK? Is that is more? Yeah, well, nuclear power accounts for around fifteen percent of um, electricity. Use again, you know, much lower proportion of total energy needs. I mean, if we're going to get anywhere near net zero, nuclear will have to be a huge part of the the, the story. But the trouble is, at the moment, um, nuclear is it's declining. Um, the the government's building one nuclear power station down in Somerset on the west coast of England. It's commissioned another on the east coast in in Suffolk. Um, but between those those two nuclear power stations, which won't be open until sort of well into the 2030s anyway, they w will not even replace the seven nuclear power stations that we are, you know we have operating at the moment. They're, they're due to reach the end of their working lives over the next um, ten years. So I mean, unless we, you know, have a huge nuclear um, building program in the next decade. We're going backwards, and um, we're, nuclear is not going to get us there. Um, you know, we're now thinking: can we build these small nuclear reactors? Bring the whole? Will they bring the cost down? But you know, that's at a very early stage. So, um, and as for nuclear fusion, which is you know the great sort of holy grail of um, clean energy, I mean. If we'd been having this discussion seventy years ago, you know, nuclear fusion would have been the great answer. I mean, it may still, um, you know, one day produce more energy than it consumes. But you know, even the the fans of nuclear fusion admit that we're several decades away from having a working nuclear fusion power station. But that's not going to help us with a twenty fifty net zero target, is it? Is there any uh, chance of extending the life of those current uh, atomic energy stations you have? Um, yeah. Maybe extend them by a few years, but um, you know, nuclear plants have a have a you know a limited life. After that, you, you start getting sort of cracks in reactors and things. You, you know, you've got to close them down for safety mm -hmm. reasons. But if it was up to you, if you were in charge of the energy policy, would you build a lot more of the uh, nuclear power? I think I think I would in, investigate building more uh, small nuclear reactors. I think the trouble with the big ones, the ones we have at the moment, is um, you build them in a small country like Britain. Um, you know, it's nuclear power is very very safe, but and it you know even Chernobyl killed only about fifty people. But um, it's the economic cost of um, what would happen. Um, 
you know, we've got a, a nuclear, the, the nuclear power station being built in Somerset. I mean, if you draw the 35 kilometer exclusion zone, which they had to do around Chernobyl, if you draw that around the Hinkley plant in Somerset, well, you'd have to um, evacuate Cardiff, you know, it's a huge city of half a million people and many other towns as well, and would cut off the main road and railway line to the southwest of Britain. Although nuclear is very safe, that you've got to think about the very worst case scenario if you did have an accident. And um, I don't think we've ever really dealt with that that problem, overcome that problem in, in Britain. Well, I mean, the steel and cement making, they're the other sort of very globally, they're very big producers of um, carbon dioxide. I mean, not just because they're energy intensive, but because the the process emissions, you, you make um, concrete, you, you release car- large amounts of carbon dioxide in the chemical process, the same with steel to extract um iron from iron ore, you've got to have a reducing agent to combine with the oxygen in the iron oxide to produce you iron. And, um, you know, the, the, in future, we may be able to use hydrogen to do that. But, um, you know, again, that's a sort of embryonic technology, which has not been proven. And um, if we're so obsessive about it, to say we're going to eliminate carbon emissions from Britain by the year 2050, what well, basically means just saying goodbye to our steel industry, saying goodbye to our cement industry and importing those goods instead. But of course, you know, a lot of steel that we'd import instead is made in China. And how do they make it in China? They make it with coal. So, I mean, you're not actually gaining anything I mean, from a global point of view. You're, you're actually increasing, um, you know, carbon emissions by exporting our, our steel industry. I mean, agriculture, similarly, we, you know, agriculture is a big producer of carbon emissions, uh, methane from cattle and so on. Um, What does the answer to that so far seems to be the government say, well, we'll eat less meat or we'll import more meat and we'll drive the the industry abroad. But I mean, that doesn't make sense. I say, well, if you've got methane emissions from cattle, well, deal with the methane emissions. Well, I mean, you know, there were suggestions now that cattle are going to be fed additives which make them produce less methane. Okay, that's great. Do that. But don't, you know, don't sort of, you know, close down a whole industry just because you don't like the emissions. You did say that people over there, I think it's true over here in the U.S. too, they're willing to virtue signal by saying, sure, I believe in the climate crisis or whatever. But when it comes to not eating a hamburger when they really want to eat a hamburger, people just eat the hamburger, don't they? Yeah. (laughs) People will I think um, the public has shown very little interest in going vegan as a whole. There's a there's a very powerful, um, small and very powerful vegan lobby who think we we should all do that for the sake of the planet. And you've got students at you know at Cambridge University um, trying to persuade the university to stop serving meat in its canteens and so on. But um, I think and all these students, um, a lot of students did vote for it. But um, you then go down to the hamburger van in Cambridge on a Friday night and there's a lot of big queues. So I think, um, you know, if the university stops serving meat, I think people are going to get it from somewhere. There is no movement for meat eaters to force the vegans to eat hamburgers, is there? Any sort of a counter movement? <laughs> I, don't, I have no desire to force people to eat hamburgers or anything else. And people eat what they like, but exactly. so I wish they would just stop um, lecturing those of us who do eat meat. I, I am the same. Okay, this has been really good. I've totally enjoyed this. Um, I, I enjoyed reading your book, Not Zero. Do you have any other books in the hopper ready to, to be written? I'm though though I'm mulling over the idea for the next book yet, but I'm I'm not sure what I'm going to do. But um, I've previously written on surveillance society and silly rules and regulations, and there's there's also a novel on the uh, climate um, climate change called The Denial, yes. which um, is a about a guy who gets caught up in cancel culture because he, a retired meteorologist, has the wrong views on climate change and gets. Uh, cancelled so that's the, yeah i have that book book too I've... yeah that's a good one too and then you're writing for the spectator the telegraph and the the mail all of them yeah the mails and the times as well i'm a freelance journalist i write for a number of uh, 
British okay. newspapers and magazines. Okay, and you mostly are concentrating yeah. on, on uh, climate and energy right now, or do you write on a bunch I'm of other the, stuff? Yeah. I write on politics, current affairs generally, but I say climate change and energy is um, taking up a lot of my time at the moment because it's uh, such a such a big issue. All right. Well, thanks again for all the work that you're doing, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Thank you, Tom. Ross Clark. Talk to you later.